morning, everyone. And a very happy St. Patrick's Day to you. I'm very sorry, but I've got no rugby results for you today. As we come to worship, and particularly as we come to the Lord's table, uh, the prayer book tells us that we should be at peace and in harmony with our neighbours. So we're going to begin with a prayer that is about that harmony. So will you please share in saying this prayer with me? Help me, Lord, to be more like you, to draw the circle back in the of our next Give me a genuine love for us, both those I like and those I don't. Help me to overcome my fears and prejudice, and to see your image all. Amen. In the Old Testament, there uh, is a story about the city of Jerusalem being besieged by a very powerful enemy. And the siege goes on for a long time until people are desperate and starving. And one night, Two beggars in the city look out over the parapets and very strangely the foreign army that was surrounding the city has gone. Wonderful. So these two beggars decide to have a little celebration. And they have a few flagons of wine, and I don't know, maybe they had a cup of Welsh whiskey. Um, and then all of a sudden, they come to their senses. And they say to each other, this is a day of good news, but we are keeping it to ourselves. In a way, what we're going to think about later on in the service, the Last Supper, is a wonderful story of good news. Because it tells of God giving himself to us entirely and completely, without any condition except to say to us, you are responsible for sharing that love with everybody that you meet, and in fact, with the whole world. So the theme is actually very, very simple. It's giving. It's what God is giving to us. And it is sharing as we go out from this church this morning. Sadly, the young people are going to leave us in a moment, so as they go out, we're going to take up our offering for God's work. Today is also Passion Sunday, the beginning of Passion Time. So we share together, or we hear the collect for Passion Sunday, and then we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son came into the world to free us all from sin and death. Breathe upon us with the power of your Spirit, that we may be raised to new life in Christ and serve you in holiness and righteousness all our days through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
And we say together, Our Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sin, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trouble, and deliver us from you. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And so we hear our first greeting from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Reading is from 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, reading 17 to 26, entitled, Correcting an Abuse of the Lord's Supper. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions amongst you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt, there have to be differences amongst you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, for when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers as a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. And so we come to the word of God to us this morning in the gospel. Our second reading this morning is taken from Matthew 26, verses 17 to 30. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go, just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is the word of the Lord. We are coming towards the end of our preaching series. It has been a challenge for us as preachers, and I hope for you as listeners. Tell us, please, also in honesty, where we could have done better. I kind of feel this morning that I should apologize on behalf of all the world's preachers for all the times that we have made scripture a school of theology or philosophy or logic or morality when actually it's all about the love of God towards humankind supremely revealed and expressed in Jesus. So as we work our way through the events of Holy Week, we come to the Last Supper. And it is with some trepidation that I venture to comment on such a central element of our faith and worship. The Last Supper was actually a meal as such. And the format was that of a Passover celebration. But some 20 years after Jesus had shared that meal with his disciples, it was, as we heard from our first lesson, already a cause of division in Christian communities. And that which was intended to unite in fellowship, all those who put their faith in Jesus, proved to be one of the greatest sources of contention throughout Christian history. To the extent that some scholars have described it as a greater scandal than the cross itself. Paul was horrified to find that at Corinth, the wealthy and powerful believers enjoyed a lavish meal in luxurious surroundings. But ordinary Christians, many of whom were slaves, were excluded because they could not attend at the appointed time. And even if they managed to be present, they act frugally outside in a courtyard. And I think that's why Paul feels it necessary to recount the story of the Last Supper. The utter simplicity of the meal and the words spoken by Jesus seemed at Corinth to have already been forgotten. Now Paul's account is much earlier than the first gospel account in Mark and we therefore have to take it as an important record. Sadly, when you read the gospel, you see this similar disunity in the behavior of Jesus' own disciples gathered round the table. On the way to Jerusalem, they had been arguing about which of them was the greatest. The Gospels give the general impression, don't they, that 
Peter, James and John had some kind of higher status. But whether the other disciples recognised that is debatable. So you can imagine as they came together for the Last Supper, the arguments about who's going to sit next to Jesus. And if you want some ideas on that topic, look at Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper. Jesus tells them that there is a traitor among them and they all show a complete lack of confidence both in themselves and the others. My observations this morning draw heavily on the book that Colin suggested as a theme for our Lent series, William Barclay's Crucified and Crowned, plus Dr. Nigel Watson's commentary on Corinthians. But I encourage you, friends, to reflect and to read on your own account and not be put off by those people who say this is too heavy for ordinary people. The theological and liturgical arguments about how we celebrate Holy Communion actually matter very little when put alongside the action of God in Jesus Christ towards us. So we come to a closer examination of what happened at that original gathering in the upper room. Houses in Jerusalem had a ground floor, which was a living room for resting, sleeping, cooking, eating, everything. The upper room was reached by an outside staircase and was normally reserved for private devotions and hospitality for guests. And if you get the chance to go to Jerusalem, you can visit a place called the Coinaculum, which clearly shows what an upper room was like. There's evidence that Jesus had prepared for the occasion very carefully and in accordance with Passover regulations. It had to be an evening celebration. It had to be within the confines of Jerusalem and it had to include the company of at least 10 persons. By our reckoning, the Last Supper began on the Thursday evening at about 7 or 8 p.m. and lasted several hours. So when Jesus left, for the short walk to Gethsemane, it was not far short of midnight. Reading those first three Gospels in our Bible, you find slightly different versions of the words that were used by Jesus as he dispensed the bread and the wine. Already different traditions were developing to meet the perceived teaching needs of different Christian communities. The Passover tradition had the breaking of bread before the meal and the sharing of the cup after the meal. But sometime on in church history, the two were brought together. 
Now, it seems logical to me to assume that the basic form of what Jesus said was concise, and that the fuller texts that we have were constructed for teaching purposes. John's Gospel has a different take on the timing and nature of the evening altogether. As we discovered, Paul's version in 1 Corinthians is by far the earliest account and must have come to him from all the Christians who were Jesus' contemporaries and had fled Jerusalem because of persecution and gone to live in Damascus. So I suggest to you that at the distribution of the bread, Jesus' words were perhaps simply this, is my body. Now, long practice has burnt into our minds the direct association between the bread and wine and the body and blood of Christ. And we may understand this to be symbolic, or we may, as in Catholic teaching, assume some sort of physical transformation of the elements into Christ's body and blood. But all these interpretations can be challenged. And I think perhaps on the screen, we have that word, gufa. Gufa is an Aramaic word that means much more than body. So when Jesus said, this is my body, He's not referring to a physical body or a torso. He's saying, this is me giving the whole of myself to you. And that could, of course, mean so many things. It means Jesus giving himself for the life of all who put their trust in him and going so far as to give up his own physical life in death on a cross. It could mean too that Jesus is inaugurating a new Passover where the sacrifice is not the lamb of the Old Testament but Jesus himself. And perhaps more importantly, Jesus is assuring Christians of every time and place that he is really present with them. And surely this has come down to us because after the 40 days of resurrection, post-resurrection appearances, the first generation of Christians knew that Jesus was still with them, although they could not physically see him. All this, of course, is the work of the Holy Spirit. And this was so important that it must have been one of the first things Paul learned when he was picking up the Christian faith from those disciples in Damascus. Equally intriguing are the words that Jesus used about the cup. Now, when we come to the Lord's table, we always assume that the important thing 
is the, co is the contents of the cup. But looking at what Jesus said, what if the cup itself has passed from person to person is the important thing. And that the cup symbolizes, these are the words Jesus actually uses. The cup symbolizes the new covenant, embracing all who venture to put their faith in Jesus. And again, there's a reminder that it's all founded on the self-giving, sacrificial death of Jesus. Take from this that the entire action of God in Christ is about such an abundant love that it is not just for individuals, but about fellowships and communities and nations. In particular, it's for the community of the faithful, the new Israel, and a model for how we are to live together as God's people. Now, you will notice in what we have read out, there were also the words, do this in memory of me. And some scholars maintain that this was added by the church to make clear Jesus' intentions. It's not very easy though, is it? To be clear about what Jesus' intentions were. Was he launching a revived or renewed or revised Passover ritual? to be celebrated each year? Was he initiating a ritual or symbolic meal which has become such a part of our life as a church when we share together in Holy Communion? Or could Jesus simply have been saying, whenever you come together as a faith community or even when you come together as an individual Christian family, remember what I have done for you and that I am with you. You might remember that Victorian piety included a framed verse that was in every home, hanging on the wall. <coughs> And it said something like, I can't remember the exact words, but it said something like, Christ is the unseen guest at every meal. Now we've got another word on the screen, the word anamnesis, which is a Greek word, and it's meant to make you think that us preachers are educated. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's the word memory. But it means remembering in a special way. Nothing to do with remembering what we had for dinner yesterday. It's about remembering a past event as if it were in our present conscious moment. So when we take the bread and the wine, it, as, it is as if we are in the upper room at the Last Supper with Jesus. Now, undoubtedly this morning, I've ignored my own counsel. I've done what most preachers do and made this far too complicated. <laughs> but friends, what you and I are to take away this morning is this. 
the unconfined love of God given to us in Jesus Christ without any precondition. And this we remember specifically as we partake of the sacrament, but it is always there with us in the presence of the risen Christ. And we are also to continually remind ourselves that what God gives us in Christ cannot be kept to ourselves. With Christians of all persuasions and practices, we have to learn to live together as God's family, Christ's living body on earth. We are to live for others as Christ did. And that means going beyond our existing church family to those who have never encountered Jesus. And as we move towards Holy Week and Easter, in the story of the Last Supper, the pattern is there for us to see. To thy church, the pattern gave. Show how true believers live. Amen. Amen. Our prayers of confession and penitence, I think, are on the screen. And if you could again, please join with me in saying these prayers. Forgive us when we forget to pray, when we turn your love into legalism. For freedom is to save for God's sake, the Holy Spirit our hand. For us we can get in our glory, and we make your church an exclusive love. Forgive us when we get in our our contempt and we lock him up in walls and houses, words and structures. Forgive us, merciful God. And so we come to our thoughts about the rest of the world. And firstly, Anna has kindly sent us uh, a message from Open Doors. And it says, in Ethiopia, a new well was built with support from Open Doors. And the church asks that during Ramadan, which of course has started, Christians give priority to Muslims when collecting water. This kindness has surprised Muslims and eased tension between the two groups. So this morning we praise God for this newfound peace and we pray that relationships between Muslims and Christians there flow. For the rest of the prayers there is a response so when I say, Lord, in your mood, Lord, have mercy, will you please respond with Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, our Saviour, born for us. Bring healing and peace to all people. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ baptized in the Jordan, give hope to all who come to you. Lord, have mercy. Christ tested in the desert, give courage to those who are tempted. Lord, have mercy. Christ, who comforted and healed, bring wholeness to all who are broken. 
Lord, have mercy. Christ, who hung in agony on the cross, bring strength to those who suffer. We remember in particular the Middle East and Eastern Europe. Lord, have mercy. Christ, who died to save us, give peace to all who face death. We pray for our local hospices and hospitals. Lord, have mercy. Christ raised from the tomb, bring light and life to all the world. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ present among your disciples, unite all your people in love. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Amen. The grace of Christ attend us, the love of God surround us, the Holy Spirit keep us this day and forever. We share together in the grace, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all.